Welcome to Inside Seaweed. This is the podcast where we talk about the incredible world of seaweed and how this growing industry is bringing innovation and solutions to address climate change and the environmental crisis. My guest today is Dr. Thierry Chopin. He was born and educated in France, where he gained a PhD from the University of Western Brittany. He then moved to Canada, where he is Professor of Marine Biology at the University of New Brunswick in St. John. He is also the founder and president of two companies, Chopin Coastal Health Solution Inc. and Turquoise Revolution Inc. He is a true global expert on seaweed cultivation, to the point of being knighted by his native country in 2021 for his extensive research and passion for seaweed. He has published more than 250 papers, spacing from cultivation of seaweed of commercial value, integrated multitrophic aquaculture, which you'll hear referred to as IMTA, economic diversification and societal acceptability. Dr. Chopin promotes a greener blue economy, which he branded the turquoise economy, in which ecosystem services are recognized, valued and used within a circular economy approach. We had a wide ranging conversation. I certainly learned a lot, had a great time, laughed a few times even. So hopefully we'll make you laugh a few times as well. Here it goes. Dr. Thierry Chopin, such an honor to talk to you today. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing well. Thank you very much. And it's, I'm glad to talk to you too. Thanks for making the time today and welcome to Inside Seaweed. I'd like to start, if I may, with the, with the ice bucket challenge. Do you remember that? Yes. <laughs> you sound worried. I'm going to show you a very, very short clip. Yeah, Sakarina. So that's the three camps we have here. Can you see, can you see the screen? <laughs> yes, yes. Ice bucket challenge. All right. Okay. Go, Adrian. <laughs> okay. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> uh, oh, nice camp. And you know these camps, they are. Uh, for they are for those impressive. listening to this, I should point out that uh, there was seaweed in that bucket <laughs> with what looks like some very, very cold water oh yeah those it was they were uh, ice cube it was not only seaweed but they were ice cube too <laughs> so that that was back in 2014 i believe yeah i don't remember the the year because with covid we lost track of everything lose track of everything but um yeah it was at the but where are we uh, that was uh the bell fondi uh just uh, not very far from where the university is. And it was the year where there was this uh, ALS uh, water bucket uh, challenge. And uh, you were having somebody throwing you a bucket full of ice cubes and we added seaweed uh, and we made a donation for uh, ALS. So um, is that is Bay of Foundy where, where you're based at the moment? Yeah, yeah, no, I am based um, in Saint John, New Brunswick, which is on on the Bay of Fondy. Um, on the water, never get that warm, but uh, when you add a few ice cubes, <laughs> that's even colder. <laughs> yeah, and I bet nobody did it with seaweed before. <laughs> no, that no. must have been must have been the first. <laughs> Interesting to know the story behind it. Yeah, for sure. Moving on to the the, the recent paper that that you um, published, um, farming the ocean seaweed as a quick fix for the climate yes. question mark yeah. we often hear people looking for a silver bullet to fix climate change or the environmental crisis uh, when in reality what we need is a portfolio of, of solution yes yeah. should we shift our approach do you think from trying to find the solution uh, to a mentality where we look at implementing many different solutions uh, whether it's electric cars solar panels nuclear yeah. etc yeah. And the follow-up question is, um, can we, seaweed be one of these solutions? What, what role can seaweed play? Yeah, no, um, seaweeds, you know, I, I have been working on seaweeds for 42 years, and that's why my beard is white now. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, over 42 years, yes, uh, the, uh, seaweeds are great, uh, great organisms, uh, a lot of properties, very uh, diverse properties and very diverse use, uh, uses. Um, but at the same time, uh, yeah, we should not uh, depict 
predict or describe seaweeds as, as a silver bullet that will solve uh, all the problems of the world. You know, when when I hear or when I read um, seaweeds, uh, underwater superhero uh, that will solve all the climate change issues and all these things, then I have problem with that. But yes, uh, seaweeds can be part of the solution, not 100%, but they could be maybe 10% solution for that, uh, 5% uh, solution for something else. So it's a combination on then other things and seaweeds, uh, mangroves, uh, salt marshes, uh, uh, solar, uh, wind farms and all these things. And also seaweed, you have to see them not only as growing them, but also seaweed as substitution. Can we use seaweed for other products that require more carbon to be uh, grown or to be processed? And can we substitute by seaweeds and on that save in, uh, in carbon uh, emission? So that's the kind of things. Um, but yes, no, seaweeds are great. Don't take me wrong. Seaweeds are great, but they are part of the solution. They are not 100% silver bullet. Uh, and they can be used in many things that all together will help. So it, they're not the solution, but it, definitely we shouldn't dismiss them as not one of them. No, no, that's, that, that, that's correct. Yes, uh, yes. And uh, in terms, for example, of carbon sequestration, we, we have to be uh, uh, careful uh, because, like, for example, if you grow seaweeds, and then you transfer them to land, and on land you transform them in something else that will be used for food or other application. Your carbon doesn't disappear. Your carbon is transformed on this part of other compounds that you will use or that you will eat, but the, the, the carbon doesn't disappear um, you know, magically. Uh, so that's what I like to talk about transient sequestration. So what what really happens to the carbon once you've harvested the seaweed? Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question because, for example, uh, we grow red seaweeds, uh, let's say, in Indonesia and the Philippines, and this seaweed will be used to extract uh, carrageenan on agar, which are used as gelling agent, emulsifying agent. But so you sequester transiently carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus in your seaweed, you harvest them, you transform them in phycocolloids, uh, but uh, these carrageenan, these agar, uh, in terms of chemistry, are repeat unit of two sugars, okay? So uh, on each sugar has six carbon. So carrageenan on agar, that's 12 carbon, 12 carbon, 12 carbon, 12 carbon, 12 carbon, polymers of 12 carbons, and it means that in your ketchup, you have a lot of carbon in your ketchup. So you harvest you uh, you uh, uh, harvested it from the sea. You process it. It become another product. It has not disappeared. It has not been permanently sequestered. It has been transformed in something else. And you know there is a great sentence from uh, the French uh, chemist uh, Lavoisier uh, more than two centuries ago. Say uh, nothing is lost. Nothing is created. Everything is transformed. And integrated multitrophic aquaculture, uh, circular economy is all based on transformation, but it doesn't disappear. It's now a good time to start talking about um, slow carbon cycle and fast carbon cycle and maybe explain the difference. Yes between those two concepts for those that might not be familiar with it. Well, the, the, yeah, the, the, the slow carbon, that's what we talk in our paper, the, the slow carbon uh, cycle, it's when you uh, take something and you recycle it. Yeah, we have a diagram in, in our paper. Um, uh, so the, the fast carbon cycle, it's something that you recycle uh, and that's maybe uh, over 10 years uh, compared mm -hmm. to if you want the slow carbon cycle that will be something where the carbon is stored um, not necessarily permanently but is stored for more than 10 years uh, because that's, is that the cutoff then? For, for uh, us, please. yes. Uh, fast carbon cycle is uh, less than 10 years. Uh, slow carbon cycle is more than 10 years. But even that, there is um, not much agreement at the present time on what is sequestration. Is that when you put carbon aside for 
50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. Mm -hmm. Not everybody agree on that. And for me also is um, the word, the word sequestration. Uh, we have uh, modified it because originally, uh, you know, for example, you sequester a jury, you have a, a court trial, uh, you have a jury, you sequester the jury, <laughs> but that's for a few days, maybe a month. Hopefully not for but, 10 years. But it's not to, to make them disappear permanently. Uh, so after a few days or a few weeks or months, they are released after they gave their verdict and everything. So sequestration originally has nothing to do with permanent. So the, these ideas that carbon has to be sequestered permanently or nothing. No, uh, we. that's why uh, we, in the paper, we use the term transient sequestration. It can be sequestered for a while and then used for something else. One of the other areas discussed, uh, obviously linked to this uh, in your paper, is pointing at some of the potentially false claims attributed to seaweed and, and carbon sequestration. From your perspective, what is, what is the most frustrating claim that you've heard about seaweed? And climate change. <laughs> uh, well, there is this idea, yes, uh, seaweeds are the superheroes, they are the warriors uh, that will save the planet. Um, another thing also that we see all the time in the media, in social media, the news, is this idea that seaweed can grow up to six feet a day. Um, yeah. It's something that is around. Um, Uh, I have tried, other people have tried to find the origin of this thing. Um, that's not true. Um, yes, you have um, kelps, uh, and uh, especially on the Pacific coast, uh, we have giant kelps. Uh, on the East coast, we have kelps, but they are not as giant. Um, but even giant, uh, giant kelp doesn't grow six feet a day. I mean, six feet a day is almost uh, two meters a day. Um, that, 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 that's huge, but it's around. And then the problem is, um, what happens when you have, you know, this famous uh, elevator speech? So you are in the elevator, you have a few <laughs> seconds to convince uh, an investor before you arrive to uh, floor one or floor two. And of course, you go with, uh, oh yeah, but you know, seaweed grow uh, tremendously uh, up to six feet a day. Uh, so of course, the investor will be, oh, geez, that's unbelievable. Um, and then if you start to make calculation based on these wrong numbers, then you say, okay, there is so many tons and there is so much carbon in per ton, blah, blah, blah. So you arrive to wonderful numbers, uh, but that's not the case. Is this sort of mis misinformation or misinterpretation of the, of the data part of what pushed you personally? to uh, publishing the paper in the first place. Yeah, yeah, no, we were a few people. We are five people on, on this paper. And uh, yes, um, we know each other for a while and uh, we say, it's about time um, we um, work together and put something together because so much is going on, uh, so much hype. Uh, and that's funny because for me, you know, I. I I have been, as I say, I have been working uh, on seaweed for 42 years. And I would say for 40 years, I have been seaweed, seaweeds, um, don't forget them. You will see one day seaweeds are important. <laughs> and now the last two years, I have been, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. Seaweeds are great. Like I said at the beginning, seaweeds are great, but let's not promise the moon. Uh, because what I have seen is... Um, when you are old enough, uh, <laughs> there was a previous uh, period of promising the moon. That was in the 70s, uh, 80s, when the idea was, oh, uh, so 70s, that was uh, the oil crisis, you know, um, Middle East oil crisis, and the price of oil went to the roof. So people said, do we have alternative to that? And then some people say, oh, yes, we will do biofuel um, from uh, seaweeds uh, and uh, everything will be solved and I mean 40 years later we don't have one drop of commercial seaweed biofuel some people are still working on it but there is nothing commercial uh, and so nothing commercial no so we promise we promise the moon uh, 
And then there is what I said this period of promising the moon. There is what I call the, the purgatory period. <laughs> so yeah, people working on seaweeds as academics or people wanted to develop companies and develop things. Then, uh, and I have been exposed to that. Some people telling me, oh, seaweeds, oh, you work on seaweed. Why are you wasting your time working on seaweeds? Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, we cannot make money, blah, blah, blah. So then you get a period for 40 years where uh, seaweeds are bad. And then suddenly, poof, we have another uh, hype period where seaweeds are great. So I would like to avoid this period of hypes and then trough, you know, the purgatory period and then hype and trough. Hype. I would like to see something much more. That's what I say, you know, we have to be careful that seaweed don't have a moment, but that we increase the seaweed momentum. We want to build a momentum and uh, uh, increase the recognition. Yes, for a very long time, seaweed have not been recognized uh, for what they can provide. So it's it's true. So that we say seaweeds are important in the ecosystem. Seaweed can provide very interesting ecosystem services. Uh, we can do a lot of things with seaweeds, many applications. That's great. But be careful because after a period of hype, there is a period of purgatory on what will happen for the next 30, 40 years uh, for students or academics or uh, entrepreneurs that want to do something on seaweed if um, we add false claims. So that's more what I am worried on where I say slow down, seaweed are great, but let's be careful. It sounds like this is something that concerns you and, and your team and, and that's obviously um, yeah. something that as, as a reader of your paper, I think came through. Yeah, okay, great. From that, then, uh, do, you, do you think is the is the argument for carbon sequestration using seaweed farming completely unfounded? Uh, and, and if so, do you think it still makes sense for seaweed farming to be part of carbon offsetting schemes uh, and generate carbon credits similarly to tree planting projects? Well, that's that's a little the same thing. What happened with? Um, uh, you know, the green economy on planting trees. And um, there have been a period of um, green uh, washing, uh, people will say, uh, green economy, green washing. Mm -hmm. So I am afraid now we are transitioning to blue economy on the period of... Uh, of uh, blue uh, washing. So that's why I, I am saying, you know, instead of uh, green economy, blue economy, I, I like, and that's the name of our company, we call it uh, turquoise revolution. Because for me, if you combine, if you make a blue economy greener, blue and green, that makes the color turquoise. Uh, so that's why we call it turquoise revolution. And that's what we we have to, to think about. So yes, we should calculate uh, a value uh, for the ecosystem services provided by seaweeds. And again, we should go beyond carbon. Everybody get excited about carbon, carbon, carbon. But as a matter of fact, in another paper, we show that there is more money to be made with nitrogen uh, trading credit on phosphorus uh, trading credit. And as a matter of fact, a lot of uh, climate change issue and also acidification of the oceans, people are always talking about carbon, but uh, other nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, are very important. That's really interesting. It, it doesn't sound like there is a, a system in place for that. I, I think nope. you mentioned this concept in a in an interview for the Atlantic International Research Center last year. Yeah. And when you said something that really caught my attention that you just said now, there is more money to be made with nutrient trading yeah. credits than there is with carbon trading yeah. credits. And and then that really... Yeah, because everybody focuses on carbon because on land there is already discussion about carbon tax. Um, but again, if you look at uh, carbon tax, as that's a calculation we made. Uh, so Canada has a carbon tax at the present time and it's plan to be increasing gradually. But if I look at one of the cheapest type of seaweed you can uh, buy uh, on the market, and I look at uh, the value of the carbon tax, 
um, I can make more money selling my seaweed for other application than selling my um, seaweed for tax, for uh, carbon tax or carbon credit. I will have to multiply the carbon, the present carbon tax by more than 50 times, okay, uh, to make it valuable for a seaweed farmer or seaweed harvester to sell uh, his or her seaweed for tax uh, compared than to other applications. So a minimum of 50 for the cheapest seaweed. And then when you look at the evolution of the carbon tax in the next uh, decades, uh, I calculated also that it will take uh, 108 years, so 108 years uh, to have um, the price of seaweed and the, uh, the carbon tax match. Uh, until then, uh, you can make more money using seaweed for other applications, uh, for a seaweed farmer to sell them for carbon tax. And then 108 years is a long time because people tell us we have to find a solution for the ne in the next 10 years. So 108 years, <laughs> it's a little longer. So, so, so um, nutrient training credits would be a, a much better from, to a certain extent, yeah. and fairer uh, way to give a financial incentive to seaweed farming and, you know, seaweed aquaculture. I, I well. think there is a lot to be done with nitrogen and phosphorus, especially when people will understand that uh, acidification on how to do the acidification has much to do with nitrogen and phosphorus. And how far do you think we are from implementing a system that would take into account nutrient trading credits? Is, is it done anywhere? No. You know, at the present time, uh, there is still a lot of work to be done with carbon because there is not so many countries that have a carbon tax. Uh, Canada is one of the countries with a carbon tax, but even within Canada, there is a lot of uh, discussion and not everybody agree and not everybody agree at the price it should be and all these things. So a lot of countries at the present time don't have carbon tax or credit. Going back to... Um carbon sequestration for a, for a second. There's been a recent article on Bloomberg Green uh, that talks about how only in the past month, uh, Google, Elon Musk, and several groups of private investors have committed to a total of more than $2 billion mm -hmm. to startups uh, that propose solutions to remove carbon from the atmosphere. When it comes to seaweed, and uh, particularly seaweed farming, can we farm seaweed for sinking carbon down to the bottom of the ocean? And perhaps the better question, should we farm seaweed for sinking carbon to the deep ocean? Well, there is a feasibility of doing it. Is it easy to do? Uh, I'm not sure. I would much prefer, instead of promising that, that we study if it can be done. Uh, because that's the, the part of the problem, is uh, promising the moon is also deflecting or misdirecting uh, the funds. Uh, my seaweeds, uh, do I want to uh, sink them to the bottom of the ocean? Or we have a seaweed at the present time we are cultivated that has a property that are anti-Parkinson properties. So do I want to help uh, solve the problem uh, of people uh, with Parkinson's disease or neurodegenerative disease in, in general? Or do I sink my seaweed to the bottom? Uh, so there is some ethical problems there. And then also all these seaweeds, um, we are working uh, one of the problems at the present time. People get better and better at growing seaweed. But what do you do? with this big pile of seaweeds <laughs> on the wharf at the end of the day. And one of the big problems is uh, drying seaweed or preserving seaweeds. So we are working at the present time on a seaweed dryer, but I get a few thousand dollars here, a few thousand dollars here, I don't get two million dollars. Um, but we need, uh, at the present time, uh, the bottlenecks are, uh, better uh, way of drying or preserving seaweeds, uh, better uh, harvesting boats. We we have been harvesting for several years now, so we know what works, what doesn't work, what should be improved. We would lack, and we have 
the idea of what will be an ideal uh, seaweed harvesters. Um, but again, I have a hard time to find the money for it. Uh, but uh, on then uh, also money to improve uh, uh, the hatchery because. Uh, See, we don't hatch eggs, but it's just like with animals. Everybody talk about hatcheries, and it's the early stage. A lot of the early stage of cultivation of seaweed before you get the big seaweed at sea, it starts in the lab. And uh, we would like to, uh, we have uh, small hatcheries, but we will have to scale it up and change things to be more efficient. That's for me as a key issue is drying, harvesting, uh, early cultivation. I would like to improve that and uh, we need some money for that. But for me at the present time, the danger is misdirecting some fund because of flashy little talks, but not addressing the key issues, the key important issues of growing, harvesting, drying. There's so much to do. And there is such an incredible range of different possibilities and applications from, uh, you know, I'm looking at the products and, and it doesn't even stop there. But if we're looking at the, at the products, you know, you can go from seaweed snacks to fertilizers, animal feed, uh, biofuels you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, uh, just to name a few. So if we could make just one thing now using seaweed or around seaweed, what do you think we should be making and, and why? Well, it's a little like, uh, you know, you told me there is not... Um uh, seaweed uh, are not the 100% silver bullets. Uh, I would say the, the application, the use of seaweed, it's not 100%. Um, at the present time, ourselves, we are developing a product for human consumption. Uh, we are also developing uh, for animal consumption, like, uh, for example, uh, sea urchins. Uh, if you want to grow more sea urchins, well, um, uh, if you want the right color, because that's very important for the Asian market, to have the right color, the right uh, texture, there is no secret. Uh, you can put them on artificial diet, but after that, you have to, at the end, polish them with uh, good old seaweeds. Uh, so there is animal feeding, there is human feeding, uh, there is um, uh, pharma uh, nutraceutical, pharmaceutical, I told you, uh, potential with um, uh, anti-Parkinson, um, cosmetics, um, bioplastics, there's some people also are talking about that. So we should do them all. Some seaweeds are better at other things. That's <laughs> another frustrating thing. Seaweed will do everything. Uh, but the problem is uh, we have around 12,000 species of seaweed in worldwide. Okay, So it's a huge group. This group is in um, evolution, in genetics, people say seaweeds are not monophyletic. They don't come from one ancestor, but there is several ancestors. So they have different properties because they don't come all from the same ancestor, like a tree uh, of life and all these things. So um, because of these different origin, they have different properties, they produce different compounds, so it means that seaweeds for, from certain groups will be good, for example, at proteins, but some will not have too much protein. Some will be good at absorbing nitrogen. Some will be good at producing a, a certain pigment, but the other will not. So, so that's the thing. Seaweed will do everything. No. Some group of seaweeds are very good for some applications. Uh, so, and then it depends what you have. Some part of the world have more that type of seaweed, more that. So, where the entrepreneurs, the company are located, some seaweed company will develop that application because they have the seaweeds that will uh, give them this product. And then, uh, unfortunately, they are not good for another application, but they are very good for that. So, I, I think that worldwide, that's why we will see. Um, uh, company uh, developing different products. There, there is also another thing at the present time, and I hope it will change again with circular economy, is uh, what people call uh, biorefinery. Uh, at the present time, just like in many industries, you take uh, a compound, 
You take a seaweed, you produce a certain compound, and the rest is waste again. But instead of just saying, oh, I produce that compound, which is maybe 20, 40% of the biomass, and then what do I do with the 60, 80% remaining? As I say, my industry is focused so much in this product, then it's 60% waste which I discard, or then if you diversify, and that's also where the company have to work, can I say my original product is 40% is for that compound, but this 60 lets me stop discarding it. Is there interesting compound in this 60%? And then I will maybe reduce it to 40 to 30%. And then my waste, because there will always be a waste somewhere. Um, you know, when people say zero waste um, in a production, there is always a little waste somewhere. Now you want to reduce that percentage of waste, but there is always some. But that's what we have to work is biorefinery. Can, can we do one species, not only one process, but several processes for several products? And that's what we have to work on too. Should we coin a new expression then? Maybe go for a integrated multi-product aquaculture. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of that? No, I, I, I call it the... Uh, inter- well, there is a, uh, working on IMTS so I, I, ISB or integrated sequential bio refinery <laughs> fantastic well you've heard it here first <laughs> there, there's definitely a, an education element isn't there and, yes. and hopefully um, I'd like to think podcasts and you know yes. um, tools like this can maybe help and, and yes. because at the end of the day uh, it, the seaweed industry in the West is, is a relatively new thing. I mean, obviously, it's, it's been going on for centuries in, in, in Asia. But I would say in the West, it's uh, it's new in terms of eating seaweed, okay? Because uh, Asians mm-hmm. have been eating seaweed for centuries. So eating seaweed in the West is new. But using seaweed for commercial application, uh, the West uh, has... Uh, pff- Two, two, three centuries of commercial use, like uh, the you know it has been used for ashes uh, and potash and, and uh, soda and uh, by burning the seaweed and then came the uh, understanding of uh, phacocolloids, so the colloids that you use in your orange juice in the morning and uh, to space at night, so that the paste two space is a paste, not a liquid coming out of your tube. So you use use seaweeds almost all day long, but you don't know it. Um, we just didn't know it. No, yeah, yeah. No, the, the toothpaste is, is a paste, not a liquid, because there are some extract either from red seaweed or brown seaweed. And the same in your uh, orange juice in the morning, uh, for uh, avoiding that the pulp settle at the bottom of your uh, uh, bottle or the cacao powder in uh, chocolate milk, uh, settle at the bottom, you, you put some sea, red seaweed extract in it. So um, so the extraction of seaweed extract, you know, in the West has easily uh, more than 200 years. What is new and what people are rediscovering, uh, rediscovering the wheel <laughs> in the West is, oh, we can eat seaweeds and after all, they are not that bad. On our side, the Turquoise Revolution, we have a lot of uh, picture in our galleries about uh, different recipes and different uh, things you can do, uh, eat seaweeds, um, and they, they, they are wonderful uh, ingredients and uh, can replace some vegetables and all these things. So, and again... And did you find that people are receptive to that kind of new product? Yes, it's, it's coming, but... Um, it will take time in the West, you know, because uh, the reaction, uh, the term seaweeds does, doesn't does help because seaweeds uh, for most Westerners is a sticky, uh, gluey uh, thing, uh, wash ashore, uh, and I don't like them. Instead of saying, well, we can do, and, and they test really good, and they can be wonderful in some recipes. Um, now we just... Uh, Last week, we just uh, launched uh, a seaweed beer. 
uh, that is uh, done, uh, that is brewed right uh, where we are in St. John, New Brunswick, by a brewery, Gahan House. Gahan House uh, work with us and we give them some seaweed and uh, they develop a, a beer. Uh, we have developed a bread mix. Uh, we are working on uh, uh, seaweed jam. And uh, so, but it's taking time. Uh, and what you have to realize is in Asia, they eat seaweeds, um, not, you know, each time it's a few grams, but it's a few grams, I would say, uh, breakfast, lunch, and supper, uh, multiplied by many millions of people, then that's a few ton at the end of the day. But uh, in the West, uh, no, I mean, the, the sushi bar... Um, you know, when I go to a sushi restaurant, for me, it's not the rice on the fish or invertebrate inside. For me, what is important is uh, the rolls around, you know, the, the generally purplish, uh, dark purplish. So what I look is, uh, for me, the good quality comes from the roll outside, not so much of what is inside. But sushi bars have been great at popularizing seaweed food, that's for sure. But it will take time. How often do you go to a sushi bar and how often do you say, oh, the, the seaweed were part of the menu and they were really interesting for uh, flavoring, texture and all these things? Yeah, there hasn't been many stories of people going to a sushi bar and coming back and saying, oh, the seaweed was excellent. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, they will say, oh, the, the sushi roll was great. But then it will be the, the roll was great. And for me, it will be, oh, the quality of the wrapper. Was, was the wrapper good or not? <laughs> well, what do, you, what do you think? I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm afraid it's probably going to come down to marketing potentially. But <laughs> what do you think the seaweed industry is doing wrong at the moment? And what do you think is doing right? The traditional seaweed industry uh, is doing fine. Uh, we should reduce the hype, uh, reduce the, uh, oh, it's new uh, and it's wonderful and it will solve the climate change. So maybe reduce a little the, the hype, uh, stick to the uh, science. And what it's doing well, it's, yes, there are new applications. Uh, there is a traditional food for human food for animals, so animal feed, uh, pharmaceutical, nutraceutical. Uh, now what is emerging is this uh, bioplastic uh, that could be very interesting. Um, so uh, let that there are new compounds, that there are new uh, applications coming out of seaweed, that, that, that's great. So diversification uh, of product. And again, in different parts of the world, it will be different type of diversification. Not everybody will do everything. Uh, that's great. So there are some wonderful uh, property of seaweed. There are wonderful applications. And then also... Uh, make people realize more the ecosystem services. You know, people talk about ecosystem services, but we have to go beyond to say, oh, seaweeds are good for that, seaweed are good for this. We have to put a value. Uh, what is the value of absorbing this nitrogen, phosphorus, this carbon, uh, even if it is temporary? Uh, what is the value of uh, seaweed uh, forest? As a habitat. As maybe. an habitat, that's where I was going. Seaweed forest uh, as an habitat or also um, reducing uh, erosions, for example. Because what uh, what people realize is, um, and there is an example, for example, in uh, an airport in Japan. Uh, so Japanese are great at uh, developing artificial island. I think it's the airport, the new airport of Osaka is an island on the sea. But they put a lot of uh, concrete blocks and everything, but it was still moving because of all the impact of the wave uh, storms and uh, the island was still moving. Then a seaweed uh, professor, uh, Dr. Hono, said, um, you know, in your concrete um, blocks, um, you should start to make holes. And of course, the engineers say, wow, if you make holes in concrete, the, the stability, the resilience and everything of my concrete will be reduced. And he said, no, no, no. Uh, make them with little space, uh, irregular and everything. And that will favor the development of kelp 
uh, beds. And so the engineer said, well, yes. But he said, you know, you have to realize natural kelp beds, what do they do? They, are, they look like a shock absorber. You know, you have the waves come like that, bang, bang. And then if you have uh, seaweeds that are there just to absorb the shock of the waves, then they would be less erosion. So, uh, yes. Incredible. So, the, I, I, in a paper uh, last year, uh, I was looking at um, ecosystem services of uh, seaweeds. So, I found uh, 22. <laughs> And then, uh, since then, I found two more. So, I am at 24. Uh, 24 ecosystem services. But the first, I think where we are is we are starting to understand ecosystem services. For me, I want to go the next step, which is, can we put a value on these ecosystem services? And if we have a monetary value, then can we use seaweeds in changing regulations or new regulations, but, uh, or incentive, okay? Uh, if you do that, you should get an incentive because you provide ecosystem services that are Um, useful for nature and useful for humans. So at the present time, we are identifying, which is important step, we are identifying ecosystem services. The next step is let's put a value, let's monetize these ecosystem services. And the next thing is let's use them as incentive to uh, develop regulation or change existing regulations. So a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, well, we need to do an episode of, of the podcast on the 24. <laughs> yes, that could keep us busy. But, yeah, busy but that's, for a couple of hours. Yes, but that's for me. I was, um, <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, it was during the the holidays, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I was on the on the beach there, and uh, I was writing, and I was putting my ideas together, and then uh, uh, yes, I came with a list of 22. So uh, I was. An enjoyable afternoon uh, <laughs> uh, on the on the beach, but it was a very uh, productive <laughs> afternoon. Yeah, 24, that's impressive. Yeah. yeah uh, Look, we, we we talked a lot about the the pain points and the frustrating things, but I want to want to sort of continue on what you just mentioned here, the future and and what sort of change and, and innovation you would like to see uh, in the industry that would make your life a lot easier, or you, that you just think is absolutely needed. Is it? Does it come down to regulation? Do you think is it is it a change of le in legislation that we need, or is it what 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 do you think it is? Yes. Um, well, uh, at the present time in Canada, like the development of integrated multitrophic aquaculture, where we mix fish with uh, uh, seaweeds and invertebrates, so biologically, environmentally, um, everybody agrees it's a good thing. Uh, where uh, we are not uh, progressing as fast as we could, uh, it's because of two things, uh, the economics and the regulations. The regulations at the present time in Canada, uh, and I think it's the same in Norway and in Scotland, uh, uh, Ireland, it's most, the regulations are mostly based on salmon regulation because it's dominating aquaculture activity at the present time. And it's very difficult from a regulatory perspective to say associated with the fish, we also want to grow uh, seaweeds, we also want to grow invertebrates because the regulations are not there for that. So uh, regulatory, that's uh, slowing us down. And then the economics, uh, because in the Western world, again, People not being as aware of seaweed as in Asia, uh, people say, oh, what do I do with seaweed? Or oh, well, what's the value of seaweed? And of course, that's new development. So the tonnage are small compared to tonnage of salmon. So, um, of course, at the beginning, uh, you make more money with your salmon than with a few tons of uh, seaweed, a few tons of uh, invertebrates and everything. So, so it takes time. But at the same time, what uh, really uh, is surprising is um, during uh, we had the Canadian IMTA network and uh, over these uh, seven years, we produce uh, 
11 uh, economic papers because uh, what was nice with this uh, network, we had um, uh, biologists, but also economists and social scientists working together. And the economists uh, produced 11 papers on thesis and it shows that uh, IMTA economically uh, make more money than a monoculture uh, of salmon. And then, um, but people are not switching. <laughs> so at the present time, it's uh, perceptions of economics on the lack of enabling regulation, uh, revised regulations that uh, don't help us. I'm conscious that it's getting late and I don't want to take you too long. <laughs> We're getting toward the, the end of this chat. And yeah. so I'm going to ask you a very self-serving question, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> what advice would you give to someone starting up a small business in the seaweed industry? Um, could be anything that comes to mind. Uh, it's a great job. It's a great activity. You will not be a millionaire overnight. Uh, so be patient. Uh, it will happen. Uh, you will develop. You have a good product. You have a good story. Uh, but don't over inflate the story. Uh, stick to the science, stick to a realistic stories. No, uh, I told you for 42 years I work on seaweed and I am convinced that seaweed is one of the very important crop to produce. Uh, but it will take time. It will take time to change perception in the Western world. So uh, uh, patience, uh, Patience and uh, science. Uh, patience, perseverance, uh, perspiration, transpiration. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, no, it, it, it's it's a bright future. So I don't want people to take me wrong. There is a wonderful thing to do with seaweed, but let's reduce the hype a little. Thierry, it's been extremely interesting to talk to you today. Uh, we've covered a lot, which <laughs> yeah. we, we were expecting. Um, it feels like we could keep going for hours and hours. Uh, I think we should probably wrap this up for now. Uh, where can people find you and, and your company online? Yes, uh, the company, uh, we are the, the Turquoise Revolution. Uh, another name is uh, Chopin Coastal Health Solutions, and uh, I am on Facebook and LinkedIn. On the company where we grow the seaweed is called Magellan Aqua Farm. So Magellan Aqua Farm, Shopa Coastal Health Solution, and Turquoise Revolution. And also uh, for people interested in my papers uh, on presentations, you can find them on uh, ResearchGate. Okay, Res ResearchGate in one word. You, that's uh, so it's ResearchGate. Thierry Chopin or something like that. And you can see uh, all my papers, some of my presentations. Brilliant. And there is a lot of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and on uh, Turquoise, uh, Turquoise Revolution, they, there is also a galleries of pictures uh, at the site, harvesting on food. And then on media, uh, we posted also a lot of uh, videos on interviews. There is more than 40, 45 TV, uh, radio interviews and everything. So there is a lot of information there. Thanks so much again. You are welcome. And thank you for the, the questions. We are really interesting. And yeah, we cover a lot, but it's just a surface. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jerry. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.